Oh man, it is good to worship with you folks and to, and to be here and to share uh, uh, the message that I uh, was uh, praying about and what I felt that, I don't know, just was led into by, uh, by the Holy Spirit. Um, I guess to kind of uh, give you a little bit about myself, though, uh, I'm, I'm not a stranger uh, to uh, uh, at least uh, orange road or, or kind of driving by here. Um, as I was coming in here, I kind of thought, huh, it's kind of a small world. Uh, as I was going to Malone from uh, the years 99 to 2004, um, I used to work down the road there at uh, Volvo Truck Parts North America in Lewis Center <laughs> for summer help. And they would hire you for 89 days because if you worked for 90 days, you were allowed in the union. So they're like they, they just kind of packed your stuff and were ready to, to get you out of there. But um, w- where I was staying, I, was, uh, uh, I would kind of uh, borrow the couch, so to speak, there at my sister's house in Centerburg, Ohio. And it's, you know, 45-minute commute down here. And the way we would go is we'd drive on Orange Road. So I was always like, I want, I, I'd like to go to that church sometime, you know. I was attending Jackson Friends at that time. Um, from uh, come from Massillon, Ohio, uh, educated at Malone. Um, uh, I uh, pastored up in Cleveland for about five years at West Park. And then uh, just this summer, we moved, my wife, uh, Megan, and our, my two children, maybe you saw them uh, step out, Brenna and Lachlan. Uh, we were down in Newport News, Virginia, um, for four years, where I pastored at Colony Friends. And uh, then we moved up here, and uh, now I'm an I'm associate pastoring uh, there at, uh, at Alum Creek. So being around Orange Road is, uh, is familiar. It takes me back to my uh, Volvo Truck Parts North America days, you know, picking parts in that massive warehouse. And uh, <laughs> I was kind of wondering, should I tell this to them? I'll go ahead. I'll, 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 I'll go ahead and, and, and reveal a little bit more about, <laughs> about my memory of this place. I remember making a California stop before that the road has the road has changed since, but it used to kind of tee off. Orange Road used to kind of end at a at a at another road, and I made a California stop there one time after working overtime, and man, I got caught. <laughs> and and uh, I was always able to kind of just talk myself out of things though. Uh, I stayed calm, you know, the, the, the police officer there wasn't too happy about it, uh, about how I made that stop, and uh, he was letting me know that, and I said, yeah, I'm sorry, officer, I just, just late night at work, and he's like, all right, well, don't do it again, you know, let me go, move along, Can put your seatbelt on, you know. All right, hey, um, as I was, uh, as I was thinking about um, all just what to say, what to speak on. Um, you know, I kind of had a... I, I, you always kind of start with your experience. And I think for the past, oh, year and a half, I've been kind of exploring and experiencing what it means to uh, uh, practice a life of discernment in terms of my relationship with Jesus. Um, discernment in the sense that where is Jesus leading? What is Jesus saying to me at this point? You know, oftentimes we can kind of settle in this gray area. You know, a lot of things in life aren't, I think we wish they were, but a lot of things in life, not all things, but a lot of things are not black and white. There's kind of a gray where, well, should I, you know, choose vanilla or chocolate or, you know, strawberry or blueberry? You know, it's just, where am I being led? Where would Christ want me to be in this moment and in this situation? Not necessarily choosing ice cream flavors, but you know what I mean. Just those, those decisions in life and having a sense of assurance, having a sense of, of being led and spoken to by the Holy Spirit. What do I do? What part do I take in order to, to secure this and to, I guess, have a, a sense of assurance with that? Um, 
as evangelical friends, you know, we talk, uh, we talk in ways that are very kind of uh, immediate and familiar with the ways of the Lord. You know, we, we hear things around churches, uh, around the people of, in the body of Christ that we've been hearing from God, talking to God, being led by the Spirit. And that, that's familiar language for us. Um, I think it's important, though, to whenever we speak that way, to there's something within me, speaking for myself, to put in to put in the work of knowing that for sure. So I'm not speaking or, or being, I guess, uh, haphazardly or presumptuous, but to you know to to tenderly know, yes, this is this is the direction that Christ would have me go, and I've put in the work to find out. I'm not just kind of. Well, it's what I want, so it must be what God wants. Well, no, how, what does God want, and how can I be led into that way? I know for myself, I've, I've, <laughs> I've made decisions and I've gone directions in my life where I've made the decision, and it's kind of like, well, God, come along with me and bless it. <laughs> and, and the more I grow and the more I kind of become familiar with, with the ways of the Lord and the ways of, of what God would have me do, that's not how it's supposed to work, is it? It's not us making a decision and, well, God, you come along with where we're going. No, it's, it's a matter of discerning where is God already at and how can I go there. Do you see the difference? There's a difference there. How do I get there? Um, well, I kind of, I, I, I compare it to maybe having, have you ever had a conversation with someone where it's a pleasant conversation, they're a, they're, they're a pleasant person, but uh, in the conversation, you don't get to say much. <laughs> they're, they're kind of going, and you don't get to kind of add really to the conversation at all. It's, it's kind of like you're, you're on the receiving end. Um, Preparing for the message, I was asking uh, uh, your secretary and, and Pastor Dave, well, what have you guys been speaking about? And he said, well, I, we, we just got done uh, having about four weeks in prayer, talking about prayer. I'm like, okay, well, this, this would probably make sense then, a good segue into prayer as an ongoing, continual conversation wherever you're at, uh, whoever you're with, with the Lord, being in communion with Christ. And sometimes, I know for me, I can have an over-talking, I can over-talk people. Um, certain, uh, certain people in my life have, have, have brought that up, and where to me, it's like, I'm just excited to be able to connect with what, what people are talking about, and I want to just kind of jump right in and talk to them about what I have to say. And so, in doing so, I'm not really listening to what the person is saying to me. I'm just waiting to say what I feel like I, that what I feel is so important to say. It's like, man, well, that's not right. That's not a loving way to kind of engage a person, to engage. And I'm not talking about new relationships. I'm talking about, you know, friends, spouses, coworkers. Being humble and kind of quiet enough to say, I, I, I want to really receive where you're coming from. I really want to kind of take in where you are at as a person right now. The thought came to me, if I can overtalk people, I can probably be pretty sure I can probably overtalk the Lord and what he wants to say. <laughs> so prayer is not just me kind of gushing or kind of uh, pouring out my heart to the Lord and, and saying, well, thank you, Lord, for listening, and then off I go. Well, when does the Lord have an opportunity to speak to me? How am I facilitating that end of the conversation? What do I do intentionally to receive and listen to what God is saying to me? Um, you know, this morning it's my hope to share about ways that the friends of Jesus, evangel evangelical friends, have uh, we've become more wise in listening. Uh, we, we've had ways 
of becoming wise and listening to what the Spirit of Christ would say to us. I think we just got done doing one of those ways of receiving and listening to Christ. It's in the worship team. I think worship is key to doing that. That's, that's receiving. It's giving and receiving from the Spirit. But as friends, I would like to kind of touch on a, a tradition that bears our name that friends have always been pretty good at. Quakers have always been kind of pretty good at being quiet <laughs> and listening and being still and waiting for what the Spirit would say to his body, the church. How do we do that today? How do we practice that today? Not, not only just as, as an individual, but corporately as a church. I think it's pretty cool that you're going through this uh, uh, series or you're going, you're going through this, what would you call it? Refocus. You're going through this refocus. And it sounds like you're doing a lot of kind of uh, self-examination, you're doing a lot of listening, not just listening to, to human wisdom and, and to, uh, to what uh, professionals would have to say, but you're also having this desire within you, according to uh, that last prayer that was said, a desire to, to, to hear from what, from hear from Christ to, about what, what is the Spirit leading us to do and slowing down and doing that. Well, I want us to kind of, let's, let's first open up to, uh, uh, if you have uh, your scripture, how, in whatever format they may have, that may be, uh, I wanted to open up with a reading here in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3. And here's a charge from Paul, where Paul, he gives the, the Ephesian church the charge to, he sets out a vision He sets out his hope for the Ephesian church. And what we as a church are supposed to do is not necessarily remain the same. We're not supposed to remain infants, but we're to grow up. We're supposed to mature. We're supposed to develop and be transformed in Christ. That's the point. The point of the Christian life isn't to remain stagnant and the same and, well, I'll just kind of stay the same until, you know, kingdom come. No, that's, that's not the point of the Christian life. The cr- point of the Christian walk, according to Paul for, for Ephesus, as well as for us here at Orange Road, is to develop. And that's Paul's prayer here, in, starting in verse 14. I, I love Paul's vision. I love his kind of, oh, his heart for the church here. He says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Notice it starts with prayer. <laughs> From every from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and height and depth And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Ooh. That's pretty heavy. To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. So that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You know, I think we can see our kind of our spiritual walk in the analogy of of an iceberg. I have a uh, I have a picture here. On the, on the PowerPoint, and kind of picture yourselves here as, picture your spiritual walk as kind of like, I don't know, I mean, I think there's, there's, uh, there's things that we see within ourselves. There's things that we know about ourselves in our spiritual walk, kind of like this iceberg. We, well, we see the rest of it there, <laughs> but if we were in a ship, we would only see that, that little part. And granted, that's a big part. I mean, that's a big hunk of ice there that you're looking at. But what we don't see is oftentimes these, that, that deep, long, and just kind of oblong shape of this iceberg that allows just whoop, a little bit to kind of peek through up there at the surface. I think this is a little bit like our lives in Christ. I think we see from the outside 
what we're kind of familiar with, what we, uh, what we deal with on a daily basis, our routines in life, our understanding of Christ, our understanding of redemption, of reconciliation with other people, of forgiveness. We have a concept, we have a working structure that we can see and that we can reference to throughout the week and throughout the months and throughout the years. But what about the rest of it? What about the other, the kind of the depths of Christ that have yet to be discovered, that have yet to be discerned within us and through us? Not that we're anything special, but because we are vessels, at, we are vessels in that we are the body of Christ in the most literal of senses. I started in Ephesians, but now I'd like you to turn here to, to the book of Colossians chapter 3, because Paul, he, he says some pretty interesting and pretty heavy things that I would like us to kind of start exploring here. If the primary goal in our life is to understand the God life within us, if that's what we're going to be doing for eternity, I mean, think about it. We have claimed the salvation of Christ. We've we have been kind of grafted into this salvation story, and Christ says that we, we will have eternal life. So we have an eternity to discover what and who God is like. That's what we're going to be doing for the vast majority of, of eternity, discovering the fullness of God. Oftentimes we think of ourselves as, as our job or as our vocation. Well, I'm a teacher. I'm a preacher, I'm a mother, I'm a nurse, I'm all of these things vocationally. We try to, di- we, we kind of slip into, oh, uh, 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 defining ourselves that way. And yet Paul, I think he wants us to define ourselves and to see ourselves in a broader way, a more eternal way, and a, a more eternal aspect that we can look at here. I don't know about some of you, but um, I've done, I do some fishing every once in a while. Um, I've, uh, who here has done like perch fishing up in Lake Erie? Have you ever done that? Perch fishing or ever, ever be out on a boat and you see the captain there, he kind of has this, this little screen and it's a depth finder and he keeps looking at it because he's, he's looking to see what's below him so that you can Kind of pull up and get whatever what you've gone out to, to get and what you're looking for. Well, in the same way, I think if we, uh, if we kind of develop and practice a, uh, uh, we practice a sense of discernment and we develop this, a, a method of discernment, that's a way of kind of pluming the depths of Christ in you and in me. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it says this. So if you've been raised with Christ, you, me, if we have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. Man, I've read that many, many times, and it doesn't, it doesn't fail to kind of kind of take my breath away in a sense. Like, wow, I've always kind of seen the spiritual walk and my walk with Christ as, as something like, oh, I don't know, something a lot smaller than that. But what this does, whenever I read this, it kind of it expands my vision of what my relationship with Christ is. Paul here is talking about me being, having died with Christ, having been raised with Christ, my life is hidden in Christ, and it's up to me to kind of find that out, to find my life in Christ. 
okay, how do you do that? <laughs> that? That's the next question that comes to my mind. And I think part of it, not, not the whole, I'm, I'm just giving, a, I want us to kind of have a tool to understand this. How do we engage this scripture? How do we kind of sink our teeth into this? Okay, Paul, if these things are true, what do you want me to do to, to kind of engage that, to connect the gear teeth so it, things start turning? There's a few things that we can do, and, and they're, just, they're plainly right there in the, into the text. Well, I already have it here <laughs> on the bullet points. Number, we'll, we'll go through it, and then I'll kind of flesh out what I mean. Number one is an incarnational perspective. Kind of a big word. Incarnational perspective. Practicing deep listening. A practice of deep listening. And then newfound glory. A newfound glory. Number one, the first step, if we're to kind of discern the life of Jesus within our lives, if we're to kind of have a spiritual depth finder to see, well, where is this life and death of Jesus being played out and animated within me. How do I find that? Well, number one, I think it's, we need to kind of shift our perspective. The first step in discerning Jesus in life is reminding ourselves of an incarnational perspectives, an incarnational perspective. Paul starts with reminding the Colossian church of who they are. Who are we? Not only whom we belong to, but he points to the union that we have with Christ. We are unified with him. There is a union. We are one with him, with his body, with his death, with his, re- with his resurrection, with his present working in the bo- with, it, with and through the body of Christ. We have a union with that. And Paul wants the Colossian church to remember that. You know, as I read the book of Colossians, I, I was thinking, I wish I would have taken the four years, well, five years at, at Malone, four years of college and kind of worked through this, through this book because I think it's a good college-age book. If you were to read a book when you were going to college and st- really dig into that and study that, I think the book of Colossians would help because the Colossians in that context and in that way, they were struggling with, the, with some, some ideas that some teachers had come and were preaching and saying, well, following Jesus is a matter of grace and being accepted by Christ, but you also have to follow some rules. Don't touch that. Make sure you do this. Don't speak that way. Speak this way. It's a matter of these rules, too. And Paul, he kind of comes back on the scene and says, Colossians, Colossians, Dismiss and put aside what, what these false teachers are telling you, and let's return to the truth and the, ma- re- truth and the matter of grace um, from which you have been called. You've been called by grace. You are one with Christ. You have a union with him. You have a union with the passion of Jesus, and that's how you're supposed to see yourself. I don't know how many times that, well, or at least it's easy for me, but it's easy for me to kind of fall back into the my life perspective. Well, this is my life. This is my ministry. This is my job. This is my stuff. This is my, 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 my. <laughs> I, I can just, I slip right back into that thinking very kind of subtly and quickly. Paul says, you want to be careful doing that. You want to be mindful of who you are now one with. He calls us back to that rudimentary trust that we first had in Jesus. I remember why I came to Jesus when I was 18 years old in 1995. It was December. And I was to a point, I had been to a point for a while now, of realizing that it really wasn't my place to be the master of my destiny in life. There was, some, there was something wrong with that. I kind of had a, this, this crisis within me. A crisis of, I, I, I need saved. <laughs> Is there anyone out, out there that can save me from myself? 
And on that, uh, that one evening there in December 1995, I, like, you know, just very childlike and humbly came to the kingdom and said, can I, knock, 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 can I be let in? And I was let in and I was received by faith. Paul says, don't go away from that. Actually, that's, that's your starting point. Grow into that. Grow into, into the perspective that I am now one with Christ. Christ isn't just a part of me, a part of what I'm doing, a part of my life. No, 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 no. Switch that. Turn that on its head that I have been given the privilege to be a part of Christ's life. I have been given the privilege of being a part of Christ's death and resurrection. Um, incarnation. That's a word that we, that we hear about, especially around December. We, we think of the incarnation of Christ as a singular moment. As, as it happened once with when, G, when the word became flesh, that that was incarnation, and it is. But I think in Paul's theology and Paul's thought is the incarnation is continually happening in that as people come to Christ, Christ is literally being unified with human beings here and now on this earth, and that we are now the literal body of Christ. Christ is still upon the earth in me and in you through that union. Oh, well, that kind of puts it in a different way, (laughs) seeing things that way. Refocusing on that, refocusing on who am I? I am Christ's. I am living out what Christ has done. So the expression of Paul's exhortation, seek the things that are above and setting your minds on the things that are above in that next section. That kind of brings us to the next, okay, if, if we are the incarnation, um, if we are one with Christ and we share in this incarnation here and now on this earth, how does that, how do I play that out? How do I flesh that out in my life? How is that supposed to be discovered and found? Paul says, seek the things that are above. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the earth. When he's, when he's talking about the things of the earth, he isn't necessarily talking about kind of the, the ecology of the earth or the needs of the earth. That's where we're kind of set to go work. It's not denying the needs of the earth. It's denying the spirit thereof, the me firstness of the earth, the self, uh, uh, I guess the kind of the, the, the selfish spirit that we've all had at one time and that we forsook and allowed it to be crucified with Christ. Paul says, don't, don't go back there. Set your minds on the things that are above. Setting your minds, seeking the things that are above. Okay, we understand the concept, but how does, how does that play out again? How do we set our minds? How do we seek these things? Well, I wanted to uh, kind of, I wanted to present this idea of deep listening. Deep listening. Forgive the, I guess, the, the subjectivity of the term, a practice of deep listening. But um, let's kind of look at it this way. Um, I want us to see deep listening as a time where you have intentionally set aside solitude, solitude for yourself, and set a time, a time of silence for yourself, and where you are engaging with the scriptures. Bring your Bible. (laughs) You're engaging with Christ then in this time of solitude and deep listening, and you're being specific as to what you want to present and bring to the Lord. I think this differs from meditation because meditation is kind of a free form, kind of like, well, I'm here to receive whatever you would have me here, Christ. Deep listening is coming to Christ with a specific question, stating that verbally, and then seeking the scriptures and quieting yourself in order to receive what the Lord would, would say about that. 
that's something that, I, I don't know, I try to practice at least once a week to just kind of to, to step away and to bring specific items that, are, that have come up in my life to the Lord for a sense and for a time of deep listening. I th- in doing so, I think, and as I read this, it's me setting my mind on the things that are above. It's me seeking the things that are above and, and doing these things. Taking time away. Turning to the scriptures. And taking time to, shh, shh. I don't always have to be talking. I need to be very kind of uh, intentional with quieting down, quieting myself down so that I may receive with what, receive from heaven, receive from Christ what he would say to me concerning a certain situation. Now, the second part of deep listening is not only is this a solitary practice, but this is a practice that, here's where it gets a little vulnerable, you can do with other people. You can invite other people into what it is that you are seeking and say, hey, I'm seeking the Lord's direction in this area of my life, and I'm asking you to help me. Number one, make sure these people are in Christ. Number two, make sure that they're mature in Christ. Because to do that is to make yourself pretty vulnerable. Because number one, you're asking for help. Number two, you are seeking where the Lord would, would be leading you and having you. And you are, number three, you're allowing them to ask kind of probing, I guess, questions to help you sift through and to seek and find your life that is hidden in Christ. I've done this on two or three occasions where I was at a junction in life where it, just, it seemed like each direction, there was no wrong way. Each way seemed right. But I needed insight. I needed kind of a depth finder into the mind of Christ of, Lord, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? And to humble myself and to go in front of people and say, you know what, I need help. What you would do in this in this time and in this practice would be you would have to let the that time breathe. You have to let it breathe. Part of that breath is allowing silence to be a part of it. Allowing silence to be in between, interspersed in between the questions that they would have for you. There's a book here that I was reading just kind of for, uh, uh, for reference, okay? So you're being quiet with some trusted friends and people. Well, well then what? Well, they would ask you, here's, here's some leading questions that, that could be asked of you. Um, is this something that you have thought about doing for a long time? Is now the time, and how do you know? Then you sit. The person seeking guidance and discernment would sit with that and there allow the silence to take place and then they would answer. Or maybe another question would do this. Is a desire to be loved influencing you? Is a desire for, a, for approval influencing you? You'd be silent. And then the person seeking guidance and discernment would answer that as honestly, as transparently as they can. And if the answer that comes back is, I don't know, okay, that's fine. And just, just one more, just an example here. Um, and I thought this was good. I read this and I was like, ooh, I kind of stepped on my toes. How concerned are you about your reputation? Concerning this question, concerning where you are, what you are seeking. How concerned am I of my reputation? I think I, that stepped on my toes because I think I'm concerned about my reputation quite a bit. <laughs> if, I, if I'm just being honest. But to practice that, I think, is, a, is an expression, is a way to interpret is an expression of deep listening. It's a way to interpret seeking the things that are above. 
because you are willing to set aside the desires of your own heart for the sake of you seeking Christ. Thirdly, a third step in discerning Jesus comes to us in verse 4 of our text, in verse 4 of Colossians 3. How are we doing, guys? Oh, man. All right. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed in glory. Um, a newfound glory. Also, I, I was kind of thinking of the term a manifested. The, the term there for revealed is, is manifested. And whether Paul is talking about, is he talking about the, the second coming of Jesus? That's when our life will be revealed? Or is he talking about something that is happening here and now? I think it's kind of both. <laughs> that Paul is seeing things in, in, in both ways. But it's a simple message that, the simple message that um, when we seek Christ and when we listen to Christ, and whenever we take that step into nothingness, we're not sure what's coming up, Christ seems to be revealed in, in our lives, and he's, just, he's right there. I think that kind of harkens back to the way maybe Abraham felt whenever God moved him to go to a distant land that he would be shown. God needed Abraham to make, take the first step and to go and to put action behind what he was being called to do in order for God to reveal the rest of the plan what was the rest of the plan for Abraham? That I'm going to give you a son. That all the land that you see all around you is going to be given to you as an inheritance to your people. That I'm going to make a promise and a covenant to you. All of these things. God wanted to reveal more to Abraham, but he couldn't tell him all of that when he was kind of stuck in the land of Ur. He had to get out of his house. I think that's what Paul is getting at here. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Whenever we decide to really trust in him, trust in his way, there's no rational, rational way or guarantee that this is going to work, but you're going to do it anyway. I think that's when Christ reveals himself, when we're willing to abandon ourselves when we're willing to abandon ourselves and, you know, maybe put ourselves into a situation that, well, I don't know, I'm not used to. It's maybe the uh, process of discernment is new to you, new to me. I've never subjected myself to people this way. I always just tried to figure out the Christian walk myself. It's, 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 my, it's my thing that I do. It's personal. Well, Paul, I think he, he invites us to to participate into something that's a little less personal and a little more dependent upon the community that's around us. What an opportunity to trust one another here at Orange Road. You ever think about that? Sometimes I, I walk into Alum Creek, and maybe it's the Spirit talking to me, but I think, do I trust these people? I know what the expectation of me is. I'm a pastor. Oh. You know, I wear the tie, I wear, you know, I, I do all of that. I, I engage with, with people, but do I trust them? What an expression of trust you guys have an opportunity to do. Do you trust one another? If you trust one another, maybe there's some of you that's saying, you know what, Pastor Mark, this idea of discernment, not just alone, of inviting people in to help me discern where Christ is leading. I've never done that before, but I would like to try. I would like to silently sit and maybe even feel a little uncomfortable, but discern where the Spirit of Christ is leading. Maybe that's something we can do. That's my challenge to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this community that they are, man, it already just seems like that, that they, are, they are already 
in a process of discernment. They're already in a process that is seeking your will, seeking your presence, seeking your face. But to do so, not just on a corporate level, but even on a, on a personal level, Lord, I ask that they would be led to flesh out the life that is found in you. God, we confess that we often are distracted people. We confess that we are often way more busy than we need to be. We confess that, well, sometimes we're addicted to the, uh, to the pace of our culture that, around, that surrounds us. And here is a call and an invitation to slow down, to put on the brakes, and to say, you know what, Lord, this, this is not my life. It's about my life being in union with you. What would you have me do? How would you have me live? How would you lead me in the decisions that I need to make? Lord, I ask that that would be our attitude, that that would be my attitude as we come to a close in this place. Father, thank you for your faithfulness, for your openness, and for your willingness to grow us into Christ's likeness and maturity. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus, and everyone said, amen, amen. Thank you.